share truth, apply scripture. He has lost everything. He lost I mean, his, 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 his family. family. Job was steadfast in his trust that God was good, no matter what that goodness looks like in the moment. Join the conversation Saturday afternoon at 5.30 Central on American Family Radio. Seminary in 
in Jackson, Mississippi, is the Hour of Holiness with your host, Dr. Bill Urey. First Samuel 13 gives us an interesting insight into the uh, the life and heart of, of Saul, who was anointed as king of Israel by Samuel. Samuel had commanded Saul in the name of the Lord not to offer a sacrifice until he, Samuel the priest, got there. But Saul remained, it says in verse 7, 1 Samuel 13, verse 7, but Saul remained at Gilgal, all the troops with him quaking with fear. He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and Saul's men began to scatter. So he said, bring me the burnt offering and the offering, fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering. Just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived and Saul went out to greet him. What have you done? Samuel asked. Saul replied, when I saw the men scattering and that you did not come at the set time, the Philistines were assembling. I thought, now the Philistines will come against us and I've sought the Lord's favor. So I was compelled to offer the burnt offering. You have done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You've not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now, your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. I think as I talk to people and deal with denominational stuff, sexuality thing that everybody's up in arms about politics now, which is coming back on the scene because we are never happy without having some political battle that we're, we're debating on. Everybody's at base asking for a good leader. Uh, I'm with the Salvation Army and we've just gone through the election of a new general. And so everybody was thinking and praying about that. The transition of a general, to, it's a huge thing for us as a nomination because we have a, a quasi-military structure. There's, a, there's an authority figure at the top, and so it's a, a very important choice for leaders. I remember hearing Oz Guinness, who was being interviewed by a friend of mine, say, when he was asked, what do you pray about every day? What's your, what's your, and he said, well, almost immediately he responded, almost milliseconds, he said, oh, my, my first prayer every day is for leaders. I pray for leaders. And I thought to myself, I don't pray for leaders until it's really, really chaotic. I don't pray every day for leaders. But here's a wise man, philosopher like Oz is, saying we need leaders. We need men and women who are moral, who, are, who have character, who have endurance and love. And we need those kind of leaders. We, we, you look around and you think, where are those kind of leaders? Where, where do you go to get them? We all have heard that, you know, vision rises and falls in the heart of one person. That's the top-down approach to leadership, and I think there's something to that. And you can see in, in much of history where one person is captivated by something, a vision, and they, leaders can share that and call people to it, and people come and respond. It's, it's where many of us have found meaning in life. We, we followed a leader. God has ordained to give us direction, which is fine. Watching the Asbury, I call it revival, the, up, up, the, uh, the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Asbury, I thought to myself, yeah, but there's also, there are also other times when the Holy Spirit works in movements. He, he moves all kinds of people. They may be individual leaders in some sense, but he's speaking to a whole group of people. Will you be the people who respond to me in this day? All of you. So that's the, the grassroots up approach. And I think both, both are historically viable. I I don't know about you, but I have always, I always ask men and women that I respect, what's the best book on leadership that you've ever read? And it's intriguing how often how often in lists, I don't care what background, what church, this book keeps coming up. It's a book by J. Oswald Sanders, written, I think, in 1994. I think that's when he first produced it. It's entitled Spiritual Leadership. When I was a pastor, about 10 years ago, 10 to, to the last six years I've been with the Army, uh, I was asked to review this. One of my the, the board chairmen asked me to be sort of the, the discussion guider of, of this book. It was an excellent request. I loved that. And I, I learned more than anybody else because I had to teach it with these guys in this air before every one of our meetings. And it was a great way to start our meetings. Very challenging. I, I, I produced a sort of one page outline. Because I, I, at least the whole these things I have felt in my life, I've been in the church, and I've felt since. Because I have been called to be a leader in some sense at various levels of my life. Marriage, family, all of this. But, but 
I could have been an outline <laughs> for for many days, if not most days, in any aspect of ministry, whether it's seminary or church life or evangelism, where I am now. Lonely? Yeah, there's there are lonely hours. Fatigue? Wow. Criticism? Yes. A lot of criticism in the church. I think we're really good at it in the church. For some reason, we're just experts at criticizing everything, especially the pastor. Wow. And rejection. And it was hard. I don't know why in the church hard for people to say, you know, I don't like the way you preach. I don't like the way you pray. I'm going to the church down the street. It's just, it's hard. I don't blame them. I know all my weaknesses, but wow. Then he said, there's a responsibility list. And they're pretty basic. One is that you are to serve, of course. You are to initiate. And that's what, hard for some of us to initiate things because you don't want to impress people, push them, but leaders initiate and they guide. So you don't, don't just begin things, but you guide people along. And that can also be hard because people don't want to be guided. They want to do their own thing. So you have to be a really careful guide leader in those places. And also the last one, which I think we've lost in the church, that's the discipline. We've lost that almost entirely, unless you've got a very mature person on your hands who realizes what they did was wrong or needs to be changed, you confront them and they helpfully say, thank you and let's grow together. If you don't have that context, they will just go down the street. That's what that's what's wrong with the church today. We have no discipline at all. But I think it's a responsibility nonetheless. And many pastors don't do it because they're afraid of money being walking out the door. Another test, the test of leadership, compromise, ambition, uh, failure, jealousy. And that's a huge one. You see another church growing, mega church kind of stuff, fancy worship, smoke machines. You've got just your organ and your hymns. It's very easy to get jealous pretty quick of those people. That's a test. You got to deal with that. The Holy Spirit cleanse you of any kind of jealousy. And then the perils. There's pride and egotism, jealousy, and popularity infallibility that's something where because you're a call leader you don't make any mistakes you can't be critiqued or worse you're indispensable well these people need me they'll never get anywhere without me wow those are perils to a leader so why am i doing that as i as i begin to pray again about leader for the army leader for a nation leader for i thought no i gotta start with me i gotta start with my heart and I went to, as you know, because I've been reading in my chronological Bible, I was here, but I, and I'm still reading, it's a huge section, First and Second Chronicles is huge, because all the prophets fit in there as well, so chronologically you've got a few chapters of Chronicles, then a huge prophet book, so it's going to take me a while, but I was in First and Second Samuel when I first started this a week or so ago, and I thought, this is the largest, longest extended contrast in the scriptures, Saul's heart and David's heart, two leaders, and it goes on for a long time. The last chapter in 1 Samuel is Saul's suicide on Mount Gilboa. The last chapter in 2 Samuel is Paul is David giving a, a sacrifice because he's sad, but he, he realizes he'll never build the house of God that he wanted to, but he's still building an altar. Very interesting contrast how 1 Samuel ends and 2 Samuel ends. So the, the two books are full of it, but it's also very similar story in first chronicles the first 22 chapters is a contrast between saul and david so it goes on and on and you gotta ask yourself what's the reason for this now what i read gives you an indication of why i think it's kind of i don't know sad really that saul is condemned from my point of view my little right and wrong he was simply impatient there i mean it was scary the philistines are scary people are coming down upon his small fear-filled army he got afraid and said lord we need you so i'm praying to you do what you know for sacrifice i think all of us in this in, in my hearing would say i would do the same and saul samuel says you're done your impatience was a direct denial of god's word in your life I, he was going to make your kingdom an eternal kingdom lasting forever but because you did that no more Wow. I wonder how many times you went impatient this morning. So don't critique Saul too quickly. Come back to your little heart and say, like I did, wait a minute, Lord. What kind of leader am I? 
I mean, when you start looking for a king, as Samuel did, and you find the, the object of your desire to anoint a man, a very tall, good-looking man, the tallest man in all of Israel, he's running around looking for donkeys, like in 1 Samuel 10, and you know you're in trouble. There's something beginning at a wrong level there. Not that he's not humble. You just don't have a man running around Israel trying to find donkeys in the Bible without there being something wrong. It, it indicates something about his self-concept. And sure enough, the day he's anointed to be brought out to Israel, to be shown by Samuel, this is the king you wanted. His name is Saul. Where is he? He's hiding among the baggage, it says. He had an incredibly low self-esteem. And he was impetuous. Just like Jephthah made that ridiculous vow which cost his, his daughter's life, Saul makes a ridiculous vow about those who eat food before the Philistines are defeated. And because his son took a little bit of honey to be revived during a battle, he said, well, I got to kill you, son. And it was the people who said to Saul, stop. What are you talking about? You can't kill your son because he ate some honey. And he's insubordinate. You no, know he's insubordinate. He doesn't kill everybody. Think about that story based upon our fear about talking about how God would destroy cities and wants everybody dead. And we think what a horrible God he is. Ridiculous philosophical concept that has risen today and we're so afraid of this thing. Wait a minute. God destroys all sin. Don't play around with stories about sin and think God's horrible. If you sin and you're not saved, you die. It happened to Israel. And it will happen to anybody who's in a church, for crying out loud, who's not saved. This is serious business sin. Now, I hate the fact that people died, but they died not because God was mean. It's because they sinned and never responded to him. And he says, destroy. And Saul did not. He worked it out so the king could live. And Samuel had to come and finish the work. It's, it's a, Let's not get lost in the ethics of our 21st century. The point simply is this. He was insubordinate. Now think. Think about this list. He's inferior. He's impatient. He's impetuous. And he doesn't obey. Killing everybody. And God says, I'm done with you. In fact, twice in 1 Samuel 15, it says, Yahweh repented that he'd made Saul. That he'd made him. Wow. It's interesting. In that same chapter... Samuel says to him, excuse me, chapter 4, 13, Samuel says, The Lord sought out a man after his own heart because you have not kept the, God, the Lord's command. And that means, of course, you know, he'd already anointed a little boy shepherd named David. God already knew what Saul was going to be doing. So David was already anointed to be king. Didn't become king for many, many years, but he'd been anointed to become king. Now, I don't even have to tell you where to go for David. This, this huge biblical figure for us. But you know the list. I'll just tick it off for you. Lust, covetousness, adultery, covers up the lies, plans a murder, and lies about the murder for an entire year. And we have Peter, and others in the, excuse me, not Peter. I think it was Peter. He has in Acts chapter 13 saying he was a man after God's own heart. Saul, Saul said, the Lord sought a man after God's own heart. What? You just told me, Bill, that Saul was inferior, an inferior complex, impatient, impetuous, little insubordination. He didn't kill one guy. And he loses the kingdom, and yet the kingdom of David will last forever. Sounds like it's pretty inequitable to me. Talk about fairness. Wow. I mean, most of us look like Saul every day. At least we don't do what David did. And David's the one that God says, oh yeah, that's, he's got a heart like mine. So as a leader, I want to think, well, wait, Lord, what, what in me needs to change? What, what in me do you need to do? I remember John Oswald, a friend and a teacher of mine years ago. I think it was a Bible study in a, in a living room. Never gotten over that moment. He, he, he said, I think what happened in Saul's life was that he never accepted who he was made to be. And you know, I don't want to tell you how old, how old I am. I thought to myself, I wonder if most of us have ever accepted who we are. I mean, really. And I said, Jesus, thank you for how what I look like. Thank you for my gifts that you've given to me. Thank you for my the talents you... Thank you for me. No, we were always 
never satisfied. There's always got to be something more. We're always looking outside, just like Saul. He never liked who he was. He was the, one of the tallest. He was the tallest man in all of it, which means he was head and shoulders. You want to know where the shampoo name comes from? From the Bible. He was head and shoulders over everybody else in Israel. Big, strapping, beautiful man. He was small inside and never got over it. He was a people pleaser. He always listened to other voices. Never listened to the voice of God. Maybe for a few seconds. Samuel, yeah, yeah, yeah. Samuel's gone. What do you guys think? What do you what do you want me to be? Always listen to other voices. He was insanely jealous. Just look at how he treated David. Throwing spears at this singer across the room. He lied to cover up his tracks. He ends up in the occult with a witch. And then in the last chapter, he commits suicide, which means I think ultimately. He never took responsibility for any part of his whole life, which is what suicide ultimately is for most people. They just can't take responsibility. One of his pastors I can do. I don't know all the source of that horrific situation. But in his case, it definitely was a climax of a person who was not able ever to be what God called him to be because he was defiant. I will run my own life. Now, what does God look for in a leader? Well, you look at David with all of his stuff, and you got a, a bold, magnanimous, respected. I just read this morning about his 300, 400 mighty warriors, 30 of them called mighty men. These guys are all like, sort of like rabbit. I would love to see a Tolkien-esque kind of movie made for David's mighty men. You want to talk about a blockbuster, that would be it. These guys are awesome. But they're ex-cons, they're renegades, and they respect David because he's a leader. There's something in his heart they can trust. He's not waving around all the time. He's not worried about who he is every day. Remember the story about him pouring up the water from Bethlehem's well? I just wish I could taste some. He says, and three guys go and get the water, middle of the night from it, bring it back. He pours it on the ground. I can't do this. It's like... It's as precious as your blood, he said. Now, that's what a leader does. Saul would never have done that. Or people like Saul. Listen, what kind of person, what kind of leader does God honor? He honors a person who's able to deal with their gift of the personality they have, and they don't overlook any sin. Now, both these men did, but David eventually came to confess his sin. Saul never did. You have two kinds of sins here. Sins of the flesh, and you all know what lust and adultery is. And you've got sins of the spirit. And that's the plot problem with Saul. He had high-handed rebellion. And the Bible says clearly there is no sacrifice in the Old Testament. No sacrifice for high-handed sin. Guy and I listened to a 12-part podcast. A famous podcast now on the demise of the Mars Hill church system. And... It was sobering for us, not because we were liking to listen to anybody having fallen from grace. That's the last thing that makes us have any joy. It's heartbreaking. But let me say to you, as we thought through the sins of us as evangelicals that we're guilty of, I sensed in the entire podcast series a total lack of accountability in leadership. This last week, I just finished another set on this fall of the Hillsong group. And again, tear-filled, heartbroken after every episode, I thought, Lord, what in the world is wrong with us? And again, refrains from, I don't think Christians this time in this series, but whatever they are, total lack of accountability, real accountability. And I thought, when are we going to learn? When are our leaders going to learn? You've got to have people who can speak to you about the sins of your flesh and the sins of your spirit. Back to John. I, Oswald, I, just a brilliant friend of mine, helped me in so many ways. He said to us, not just to me, but to us, he said, I think David's sin was an aberration. In philosophy, I would say it, he, it's, it's, it's an accident. Sins are an aberration. In Saul, sin was a pattern. It was the substance out of which 
he did everything in his life. He wasn't doomed by God or determined to be damned or what ridiculous people talk. He wasn't coerced to, no one's ever coerced to sin. He was given repeated revelation directly from God's own mouth. He was anointed by the Holy Spirit for crying out loud. He was offered grace all along his life, but he sinned it away with a pattern of self-curved jealousy. I've got to make this work. I want you to like me. Saul hung on to a self-centered agenda. He thought his brokenness was too difficult for God to handle. Listen, my friends. If that's your take on theology, stop. You're not too big a problem for Jesus. Do you think the one who walked out of the grave will find you and your problems too intractable for him? Says James Stewart. You're not that big of a problem to Jesus. If you give your life to Jesus, all of it, and Saul would not give his life to God. He wouldn't face his own responsibility, his own sin, or his sins. And the Lord said, I'm done with you. Listen, God loves who you are. He made you. Your infirmities, and you've got them. I've got a whale boatload of them. They're not sins. Sin is when you break the law of God and you know you're doing it. You're, you live with an unsurrendered heart trying to hold yourself together as some kind of leader in your context. And God says, stop. And he'll send a prophet like Nathan who will wait a year and keep coming back until you say, Lord, wash me with this. Cleanse me from my sin. Create in me a new heart, clean heart. And Lord, whatever you do, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. That's why we still talk about David. And any leader worth their salt, male or female, will say the exact same thing. Lord, create in me a clean heart. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of my saving relationship with you. One of my favorite Salvation Army leaders, songwriter, general, amazing man, I've read his life story at least twice. Uh, Albert Orsborne was his name. Gifted guy, amazing ministry in London. Things happening, booming, hundreds of people coming to Christ. And somebody above him told him he had to go to another different place. And he went, because you have to obey in the air, but he went with resentment and spent years thinking, and if they'd left me there, I could have done really something. A friend came along and said to him, you know, I've sent something wrong in you. There's something wrong in your heart, but he wouldn't listen. And so because he had this sin of resentment, he's already got sick. And one day he heard two people singing and he said, Lord, I want you to yield all to you again. I'm going to take this from me. And the Lord did. And he was restored. And I thought to myself, if I ever come to a place in life, Lord, where I've got something in me that's not of you, would you show me through my friend? Would you give to me a clean heart? Renew your right spirit in me. He can do that in you. He wants to do that. Come to him. He can make you clean. He will do it. Amen. 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 The Hour of Holiness has been presented today by Wesley Biblical Seminary in Jackson, Mississippi. Our seminary is a fully accredited theological school, which is committed without reservation to the full authority of the Word of God. This school is devoted to undergirding God's calling of men and women from around the world to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and to make disciples who will desire to live lives of biblical holiness. Dear friend, if you would like this program or any other of our series of weekly messages, our website is wbs.edu, where you can find out about all of our resources. Please feel free to contact us. Thank you for the privilege of ministering to you. We appreciate your listening, your responses, your prayer, and your support of this vital ministry.